Our panelists today uh, are all people working in this space uh, and are building solutions that are much more than just the person-to-person -person payment that uh, Satoshi had described in his original white paper as the peer-to-peer -peer ca digital cash system. Um, I'm hoping that today uh, you guys can get an idea of the things that people are actually working on and what people are will be building in the future. So our first panelist today uh, is Jameson, and Jameson previously was actually here in Durham, North Carolina, uh, working at Bronto, as he described, and now is currently a software engineer at BitGo, um, and he's also the creator of Satoshi, uh, which is one of the uh, clients uh, uh, for, for Bitcoin that allows you to infer tons of information. Uh, Andy Beal uh, works with Crowley Corporate Attorneys, uh, he is an entrepreneur himself, as I understand it, having built uh, Lumagoo, which is a marketplace for a student textbook exchange. And Shannon Code, who is an engineer at Ribbit.me, uh, he's also a local entrepreneur and engineering consultant. So thank you guys for joining us. So uh, I like to typically start with, you know, uh, what do you think, in your words, the blockchain is? What is? How do you typically describe what the blockchain is? So let's go ahead and start with uh, with uh, Jameson. Sure. Um, well, well, one thing that I usually start off with is that the blockchain is whatever you want it to be. But um, I, of course, am an engineer, so I see it from an engineering standpoint. So personally, I see the blockchain as a new type of time-stamped immutable database um, or accounting ledger, if you will. Um, it's, it's not like any type of database that we've ever seen before, but due to its simplicity and a lot of the unique uh, aspects of the blockchain, uh, we can do just a number of things with this new type of database that were never possible. Okay, uh, Shannon? So Jameson described it uh, pretty well. I uh, typically describe it as a cryptographically provable database or a database that can't be edited after the fact. So when things are put into it, they're time stamped and they're locked in the future. In the future, we can go back and see exactly what the state was at any given time. Well, can, you, can you describe a little bit more? What is the importance of time stamping? Well, why is that so important? Um, in my opinion, the, the fact that we can prove that a certain entity existed um, at a certain point in time is extremely valuable. Later on, or in the future, somebody can't come, uh, can't say they you can't prove that this particular thing existed if we have this uh, cryptographically provable blockchain because we can say mathematically we can prove that this existed at this given point in time and there's no way around it in this universe. Like this is, this time, is, this time is fact. Databases have existed for a long time, but they were always just timestamps of whatever you wanted to put into it. So now it's, you actually know that that was the time. Yeah. Okay. Now, Andy, you have, a, I think, a unique perspective on this, and your description of the blockchain might come from a different angle. Is that, is that accurate? Well, no, I mean, I would, I would you know, instead of calling it a ledger, I would call it a, you know, use a different phrase, which is a, a uh, recording system, uh, you know, and it just shows the state of things at a particular time as they as they were. Um, so I think it's you know it's most commonly used now to show the state of the bitcoins that are controlled by you know certain addresses, um, but it's certainly not limited to that. Okay, so I love to geek out about all the various uses of the Bitcoin blockchain. Like, I will go on for hours just talking about what can actually be done with it. But what is it that excites you guys? And this is an open question. What is it that excites you most about the blockchain? And why, why is that impactful? Well, I mean, the, the fancy uh, $2 word would be, of course, disintermediation. Um, and so when I give talks about the future of Bitcoin and I'm just trying to plant seeds in people's minds, um, the main thing that I tell them is, you know, if you can think of any economic interaction that occurs today that requires a trusted third party, 
then a blockchain system may enable you to completely remove the third party from that equation. And of course, that can result in any number of efficiencies uh, or speed ups um, or uh, remove you know, potential for corruption. So it's an ideological stance. It's this, this idea that you know, we have something in history that has plagued us and that you, you think the blockchain offers the opportunity to remove that. Okay? Somebody else, who else? So one of the things that really excites me is that um, we're, we're on the cusp of discovering this new technology that might solve a lot of problems in the future. There's a couple of problems that we know that it solves very well right now. Um, and it's, there's a whole lot of experimentation going on. And as an entrepreneur, as an engineer, um, I really enjoy um, you know, experimenting and being involved in that and watching what's going what, what's to come up or come about because of it. So I think a lot of people right now are trying to discover you know, what it's going to be most valuable for. And that's a very exciting time to be and because there's a whole bunch of innovation going on really fast. And it's something that everybody doesn't get to experience in their lives. Andy, what do you, what do you get excited about? Um, three things. Um, one is transfer. Uh, it's, a, it's a revolutionary way to transfer something online and have that you know, be auditable. Um, it's also a really powerful way to secure data, I think. Um, and it gives you the ability to distribute control of that data. Um, you know, I think the way I think we'll see the convergence of you know cybersecurity and uh, you know the way we store or control money on the blockchain. Um, you know, if you can if you can distribute control of bitcoins, we should be able to to to, to, to distribute control of information as well. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, it's all just data. So. Uh, and then I'm, I also think it's, it's a really powerful uh, tool for rights management, whether it's property rights or intellectual property rights. Uh, you know, goes back to the timestamp time uh, tool. That's you know that's really really important if you're a, if you're an artist. Um, you know, showing when you created something. So and that I think will all those things will create a ton of value for the people that are responsible for that data. Okay, so you mentioned the artist use case. I think that's that's a really good instance where you have a particular work of art and through something called proof of existence, which is uh, one of the earliest ideas uh, in using this database that we have as record of account, this ledger. Uh, and, and using a mathematical function called a hash function, you can represent that work of art absolutely provably as, a, as a, actually a, a small piece of data, right? And you use the Bitcoin blockchain to store that piece of data. And the moment that transaction hits the Bitcoin blockchain, it, it is stored there forever. So if anyone else produces that, that, uh, a copy of that piece of art, they can rerun that same uh, perf uh, calculation, that hash function, and go look at and see if it ever had existed before. And if it has, then you know when it, when it had existed, provably so. Let's unwrap these use cases a little bit, though. So beyond just simple so artists, movies, music, things like that, uh, you talk about asset management uh, more than just simply Bitcoin. It's pretty obvious that Bitcoin is, is something that people are moving in this blockchain. Uh, Andy, why don't you uh, talk about some of those other types of properties or things that you might represent in the blockchain? Yeah, I think securities is probably the, the, you know, the one that's most covered in the media right now. Um, Color, color coins uh, has uh, that technology has been adopted by a lot. Well, not a lot, but several you know traditional financial institutions or markets. Um, you know, and I think um, you know. I mean, use the analogy, but you're just you know you're, you're coloring a small amount of Bitcoin um, in, in assigning an asset class to that color, uh, and that's a really really powerful thing. And I think you can. I mean, you can take that model and and um, you know. Uh, Use it across any other industry um, where ownership of something is moving back and forth, um, and I, you know, it's it's a really easy thing to do. So, so uh, you're talking about equities a little bit. I think it's uh, Overstock.com has a uh, launched Project Medici, and I think more recently has launched T Zero, where the the trade is the settlement. It's this idea that rather than going through a clearinghouse or an exchange, uh, you can actually represent ownership of a company, part of an equity, as one of these tokens on the blockchain. Just simple possession of that token 
uh, is, is the share itself. Uh, and then that entitles you to participate in anything that that, that, that means in the construction of that, that organization. So rather than having to wait T plus three days, which is the traditional model for when you actually execute a trade on an exchange, you wait three days for settlement. And that, that's actually what happens behind the scenes. Here in this model, uh, I, there is a really interesting case where there might be something like cross-chain, where one chain is tracking equities, one chain is tracking Bitcoin, and there's could be a, a swap between those two chains to prove, provably exchange a crypto equity for a crypto currency. Uh, that's one really clear case, and I'm really excited about that myself. Um, Jameson, you, you've done some things, I think, uh, related to auditing and uh, other uses of the blockchain. What, can you describe a little bit about that, like your work at BitGo? Uh, so mo most of my work at BitGo is really low-level uh, blockchain indexing, which has just led me to understand you know, how the data structures work. And so you know, at the low level, as I said in my talk, a, a Bitcoin itself is really an unspent transaction output. And you're using all of these cryptographic mechanisms to lock it so that only you or the holder of the private key or set of private keys can unlock it. So if we then think of this unspent output as like the actual uh, ownership of a thing, then it's when we start to tie that to other data, that's where we start to get colored coins and other type of, of assets uh, that can come into play. So really, you only are limited by your imagination and your ability to convince other people to use whatever system of rules you create that says that this data represents this real world asset or this other digital asset. So I think that's where the real power of this, uh, this system of Bitcoin is, is proof of ownership of an asset and transfer of ownership of an asset uh, in a permissionless and permissionless in this context means I don't have to go to the notary to stamp the title when I sell my car. Instead, that title is an actual crypto asset uh, stored in the in a blockchain, if not the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, can you talk a little bit about proof of reserves? Yes. Yeah, so um, BitGo has rolled out uh, a, a proof of reserve uh, that, that was uh, based on a, a concept that I believe Gregory Maxwell came up with a while ago, but. Essentially, uh, this is a, an interesting part of some of the cryptographic data structures of Merkle trees, um, but it essentially allows you to prove that an entity is holding the, the amount of Bitcoins or assets that they claim to hold without explicitly exposing the addresses where they were stored. Um, so it's another interesting aspect of Bitcoin where you, have, you can have both privacy and transparency. So that's really interesting. Uh, there's a lot of use cases from the privacy and transparency aspect in uh, nonprofits and NGOs where there are people's donations going in and being used. Well, what if rather than having to see their books to see exactly where the money it is at all times, they can simply prove what allocations they have, that they are holding the funds, uh, etc. This is this would also be immensely powerful for banks. Uh, imagine if a, a bank could prove that it actually has the reserves it claims to have without requiring some large regulatory body to expend the manpower, time, and energy to regularly audit those banks, uh, or if they audit, get audited at all. Uh, what is, Shannon, what is Ribbit.me doing in the context uh, of this entire discussion? So Ribbit.me is um, taking traditional rewards programs and issuing those uh, those rewards on a blockchain. So similar to a colored coin, it would be on um, our own blockchain that's going to be uh, maintained by the participants in the rewards program. So for instance, your, uh, your frequent flyer miles, your grocery store rewards points, your video store points, um, they would all be individual uh, tokens on this blockchain. And depending on you know, how the different businesses choose to um, allow their tokens to intermingle. Sometimes, um, basically what this allows is for customers to trade one type of point for another, or you can do more creative things like um, your frequent flyer miles. Um, if they're not used, they might deteriorate into a, another type of token that can be 
uh, therefore trading for other types that you might use. Or if you don't have the right amount that you are interested in this particular airline, um, you can take some of the tokens that you do have and trade them for the token that you need, and take them, trade them for the reward points that you need. Sounds like it's reducing a lot of friction. Yeah, which is, which is, I think, one of the biggest things that's prevented interesting projects like this from gaining traction is because it's very difficult for this to work when you're just keeping track of it on paper, right? Especially if you're, a, you're maybe a, a small to medium-sized business and you don't have the ability to build the systems to, uh, to track all this stuff the way that these organizations do. Would this, the ribbon that, that means uh, solution also allow several companies to participate in the same rewards program together? Yes. So, so maybe where the scale of a the company, they didn't have the opportunity to offer rewards, like a single mom and pop restaurant, uh, might be able to pool together with the local community to other businesses to share sort of rewards program? Definitely. It makes the barrier of entry for a rewards program um, almost nothing. As a matter of fact, um, our model is, uh, we're, we're adopting a freemium model, and we're going to uh, take a number of uh, clients and offer them free rewards programs that they can they can issue rewards to their customers for no onboarding fee. That's that's really exciting. And that's unheard of in the industry. And that's just an example of the different types of things that can be done with this blockchain technology. Um, and I'd like to really quickly um, I was address another sort of out of the box approach for the use of this technology. And one of the things that's that's difficult right now in the space is that. Um, you know, everybody is trying to figure out how to use it, and we've got um, we've got assets, and we've got the currencies, and we've got uh, we've got all these different things that we're, we're familiar with. So, one of the things that excites me is trying to think a little bit out of the box. How can we use this technology um, to do something different? One of the things that's been in the news recently is um, police dash cams, okay, and controversy around you know whether this footage is authentic, whether it's been edited, whether it's been modified. Well, if there was a blockchain backing the video where every single frame was cryptographically provable that it came next in the series, anybody could take a look at that video and say, oh, there's a gap here. It doesn't actually, the, the, crypto, the, the math doesn't add up. Um, or this frame has been edited, it doesn't match the frames between it or the frames around it. So that's sort of a, an example, a quick example of an out of the box way of applying this technology. That's really fascinating, and so a frame for frame Merkle tree. I think it's that's that's pretty clever. I like that. You know, you're you're, you're touching on something, Shannon, that uh, that that I think has prevailed for a long time. That people just haven't really been talking about, it, except for the past past few years. We're starting to see more and more of this uh, the, the police discussion of the police state and the arguments that the Bitcoin community is bringing to the table about governance. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about maybe some of the more dangerous ideas. I think that's a very powerful, good idea. Uh, what are some of the dangerous ideas uh, that, that, that the blockchain could be used for? Open forum. Assassination markets. Assassination market. Why don't you describe what an assassination market is? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, you know, just like we had the Silk Road and its predecessors on, on the dark net, um, you can essentially create a similar type of uh, anonymous market where people will actually um, either one, one at a time or pool together funds uh, for the assassination of an individual. And then upon completion of that job, uh, escrow uh, would get signed off by everyone who paid into the pool and the assassin would get their bounty. So I, I, I don't recall the name of the, the philosopher that originally proposed this, uh, but it was created basically in theory that it actually could be a positive benefit. Uh, that there would be an incentive then to not be corrupted. Is that is that roughly accurate? Well, you know, from a phil philosophical standpoint, I guess. But you know, the moral problem that I find is you can piss off any number of people and be in the moral right. Right. They might have more economic incentive to to use a system. So a dangerous idea, indeed. Indeed. What other dangerous ideas are there that you guys have heard of at this point? So one of the things that I see quite often is um, untraceable uh, payments for hostage situations. So somebody will go browsing around on their computer, uh, happens at work a lot of times, they'll, they'll be at work 
they'll be using a computer, they'll visit a site they maybe weren't supposed to, or they'll click on an email. All of a sudden, they've now got a message on their computer that says your computer is completely encrypted, and the only way that you'll be able to unencrypt it is to go ahead and send Bitcoin to this address, and we will send you back the key. Um, that payment can't be reversed. It's very difficult to trace. Um, so that's why it's one of the payments of choice. It clears instantly. They can almost immediately, within 10, and it's to an hour can you know, transfer it to multiple different currencies. Okay, okay so Andy, let, let's let's give you a chance to talk a little bit about you know what type of clients are you accepting? What what is your guys' interest in the blockchain technology space? Um, you know, over the, for the last two years, it's been uh, you know companies that uh, are somehow involved in the you know the financial aspect of it. Just because that's been the that's been the business model that's been popular, uh, you know. But I think as other industries are learning about how the blockchain can disrupt their existing models, um, you know, I've, I've, I was a music industry major in college, so I've read a lot about copyrights uh, and the the pain points for artists when it comes to you know trying to figure out who actually owns something, um, you know. Uh, how income from those various properties should be distributed, um, and uh, you know, recording who consumes their content um, so they know who they need to get paid, get paid by. Uh, you know, that that's a really compelling thing for me. Um, so I would, I would, you know, I would love to explore that with a with a client. Um, I think. Uh, you know, um, you've got a lot of companies that are interested in tokenizing other things. Um, you know, you've got rewards points, and making those transferable transferable is a really, really cool thing. Um, you know, but I think tokenizing anything sort of naturally just makes it transferable, um, and so I mean that is a, that right there is a really, really powerful. Thing and it, you can transfer for free essentially too. Uh, so I would I would think you know there's going to be a whole generation of entrepreneurs that that are you know focused on sort of digitizing assets um, or a product um, or a or a you know a, a right or an obligation to deliver a service or anything. I mean and then being able to move that around. Uh, so you know from a, from a, because my Background is startups, um, you know, and not uh, a lot of the compliance of state financial regulation. You know, I've had to learn that because uh, my clients have to uh, have to do those things. But um, you know, I'm much more interested in the technology side of things, and I think once you get outside of the you know the uh, financial uh, use cases, and you start getting into you know. The music industry, uh, or uh, you know, start working with state governments to do you know build databases and registries for property rights and things like that. I mean, that to me, the the, the cost of doing business in those industries is a lot lower. Uh, but I think the technology is just as exciting. So, so I think you you've just actually said a lot of very interesting things, and I'm not I'm not sure that they were unwrapped. Uh, yes, but so so there. Okay, so first of all, you talk about tokenization. Uh, and tokenization represents this idea that things that, if you can digitize something, you can turn it into a, a, an asset that's digital, and we call these tokens. A Bitcoin is a token, uh, transaction output is a token, if you will. And you can move the ownership of these tokens around in this blockchain. It's not really an asset, it's, it's just the ledger, right? It's not something you physically hold. There, there's a discussion that tokenization unlocks a lot of capital that otherwise simply couldn't have been moved. Uh, for example, things that are just extremely, not extremely low value, but low, low enough value, sufficiently low, that there wasn't a system that developed to track them, to move them, or use them in service, for example. Are there, are there things you might imagine uh, in this context that you, you find interesting, that you might think that uh, uh, there might be an entire opportunity for a whole new industry? I believe that you actually mentioned this earlier, but um, you know, especially with regard to, to micro payments and tokenization, um, you know, truly being able to pay for things on demand, uh, 
whether you're paying for internet streaming you know, by the second or by the kilobyte. Um, it's being able to, to transfer, I think, these really tiny amounts of value. Um, it can be both valuable for um, you know, paying as you go rather than having to estimate ahead of time, but it can also be uh, powerful from, I believe, the, the standpoint that we heard uh, Dr. Uh, Campbell Harding talk about yesterday of unlocking the human capital in the world. And that, you know, at the moment, we have vast amounts of human capital that are in third world countries that probably don't have any internet connectivity. And there are a ton of smart people that are just out there waiting to be pulled into the global economy. And, and once we are able to distribute you know, cheap uh, internet access on smartphones to these people, we'll begin to be able to unlock their intellect and their human capital and, and even be able to pay them. And you know, if they're in a third world country, they might not need seven dollars an hour, ten dollars an hour. And and all of a sudden, uh, if you know people in first world countries are able to leverage this human capital at greatly reduced expenses, um, I can only see that being good for the global economy. It might be bad for the first world economy for a bit to have some you know leveraging changing, but and that, that speaks a little bit to, to the incentives, right? So I, I think the numbers are something like there are only 3 billion people in the world out of the seven something that we actually have that have internet access at all. Uh, so I think that the prerequisite here is we get them internet access, right? So that they, when once they do, and they have the means to, to, to leverage themselves, they become globally connected. We're, we're wiring in another 4 billion plus people into the economy. And the, the net gain of that uh, is massive, right? Think of, think of the, the, global, the global GDP, if you will, the GD, GDP, um, and how much that'll increase when there's so much more ability for people to produce and earn in, in return for that. I well, I mean, we're already seeing what both Google and Facebook both having initiatives because they know that in order to grow their user base and increase the value of their company, they need to reach more. So that's the, the, the paper micro unit case is massive, and I think that's very valuable. Uh, I, am, I am going to go back to, to, uh, to Andy here just again, because I'm curious that this tokenization idea, we're unlocking all this capital, um, and maybe we're even representing a song in the, in the blockchain and the ownership and the rights, or even the smart contract of who gets money when that song is listened to. Maybe that's all represented in the blockchain. But are we really anywhere close to a legal framework recognizing that as valid? Um, so I think you know the the phrases that we've used to describe some of this technology I think is uh, kind of confusing. Um, so you know I don't think smart contracts are all that accurate. I think a self-executing contract is probably uh, probably a better description. Um, you know obligations and response and and, and the financial aspect of a contract, I think you know you can you can hard code that, uh, and you can lock in funds in an escrow you know environment. Uh, but you know there, you know there's always going to be situations uh, that uh, sort of fall outside of what somebody could have you know predicted when they designed something, and that's really what the legal systems. Or, you know, if everybody behaved like they were supposed to in the contract, then you know we wouldn't need uh, you know courtrooms and prosecutors and civil terms. So um, you know, I think you will see this this wave though of uh, software being a bigger part of uh, entering into an agreement um, and. Executing it, you know, if you know, if, if you and I have some sort of agreement online, and I'm supposed to send you something, you're supposed to send me something back. That's something that we can very easily park the, with the, you know, uh, software. You know, but if I'm supposed to mow your lawn and you're supposed to pay me when I'm finished, you know, that, you know, it's, it's not really after that. So, well, so that, that kind of gets into uh, arbitration almost. So if we enter in a, into an agreement right now, the legal framework in place. Uh, there's only one legal framework. Of course, there's settlements, independent civil settlements, but, but there's only one mechanism in place where we can go to, to, to settle that. Uh, does the blockchain offer other opportunities here uh, for, for arbitration? Um, it does. Uh, I think you know, the ability to... Uh, 
the blockchain can control funds autonomously, you know, for a period of time, uh, and that can be set by the party. So I think that's a very that's a really powerful thing. Uh, uh, and being able to distribute control of those funds, uh, I mean, we can all do that right now. And I think a lot of people would use it probably for security uh, right now. Uh, because that is, is such an issue. But you can also do it for dispute resolution too, which can be fun that way. And I think I mean, distributing control is one of the, you know, that, you ask me why, what gets me excited about the blockchain, that's, that's it right there. Um, so, you know, it's, it's great for security. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I would, I would say, you know, being able to uh, take multiple keys and, you know, distribute them. So maybe you could form a you know two of three multi sig, mm -hmm. and that's our agreement. If we disagree, we've agreed upon a third party to sign the transaction and move the assets. Yeah, even for something as simple as like a you know a, a landlord and a, and a tenant with a security deposit. That that's that's sort of the example that gets talked about. Uh, but it's a good one. Yeah. So yeah, smart contracts I think are only going to be as powerful as we can create the oracles that will power them. So you know, in order to have self-executing contracts, you have to have some, and this is just sort of a nebulous idea, but an oracle out there who operates an API that you can call to get the you know, true or false conditionals of whatever the smart contract is based on. So like a very, a very simple version of that is at BitGo, we are the oracle. We're not really doing smart contracts as I would describe them, but we are holding one key and people have to request uh, permission uh, through us for us to sign off on any policies before we'll create transactions. So that's a simple version of an oracle in uh, you know, utopia land. We will eventually be able to figure out how to trustlessly create oracles that just exist <coughs> out in the cloud of the internet that can give us truthiness of any number of arbitrary real world conditions. <coughs> But I think that's going to be the real challenge. So let, let, let's talk about that. So we've got some challenges there, right? What are, Shannon, let, let, let's go through some of, what do you think the biggest hurdles are to seeing some of these ideas through to fruition? So it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, I've been in, in software development, and um, my wife is a software tester. And we've been in this industry longer than I um, have known about Bitcoin. And one of the things that um, plagues software development and creates the need to have testers is code is not written perfect. And um, I think one of the biggest hurdles that we are going to face, um, not now, but um, in the near future, are people putting their trust in smart contracts that aren't necessarily written as well as they could, or um, they're just, the complexities have gone out of hand, because in order to make a smart contract um, or self-executing contract that is going to be um, have a whole bunch of different conditions, you need a whole bunch of small moving pieces that might have been written by multiple people. Um, and it might work the way it's supposed to, but sometimes it might not. So um, in the near or so immediately we need to solve a lot of problems. We just need to actually write the programs. We need to invent the ways to to do it. We um, there's a lot of smart people, and we can we see this, this this blockchain technology, and we get excited because we know that the we know a lot that it can do. Um, but there are thousands, if not millions, of man hours that need to be invested into it to, to really discover how. I don't see too many other industries that I can look at and say, I know I can do this, but it's going to take five years to figure out how. So as an engineering community, we often say that complexity is the enemy of simplicity, but some of these things will take a long time to develop and a long time to figure out a simple way that is elegant uh, to represent these ideas that we all know are possible. Uh, and as a software engineer myself, I, I recognize that. Uh, what are some of the other things that you guys are fearful of that, that might prevent us from getting to uh, this, this, this future that we are imagining? Well, uh, we can always speak to the, the current uh, 
environment and that you know open source development is a completely different way of doing things from what we see you know most uh, uh, capitalism uh, driven companies out there uh, especially in the, in the software space so um, and even within the Bitcoin uh, core uh, ecosystem the open source development process is, is different than what we usually see so uh, Bitcoin Core uh, aims to have full consensus of the small set of, uh, of maintainers of the code base, and then they seek input from everyone else. Um, but it's not a truly rigorously defined process. It's more of a loose consensus of you know, if I if I if I see it, then I know that that's what it is. You know, I I know just from my gut of what consensus is. Um, so that that can cause us to be you know, less efficient in developing things, but it, it also um, results in us having to have much more in-depth and thoughtful discussions about making changes to the ecosystem. So it's not the fastest way to do things, but it may be the fairest way. So again, it sounds like that there's just a matter of this. This is like a, an oversight thing, right? Like this is how do we figure out how to do this? And it just feels like we're going to have to take more and more time to, to figure out how all this stuff works. It, it seems like uh, the, like the block size debate is really morphed into a governance of the protocol debate, more of a meta thing. And I I feel like this is a great opportunity that we have for us to try to solve fundamental issues of human governance. It's not just code and engineering governance, it's human consensus governance. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the answer. <laughs> I wish I did. Well, I, again, I do think it's going to take time. And uh, one of the fears that I personally have, if I haven't expressed uh, myself eloquently enough, uh, is the, the burden of regulatory pressure. And we may not be given the opportunity to take this time uh, because we, it's cut short. Um, let, before we move on to questions, I hope, hope we still have time. Um, okay, good, excellent. Uh, so let's assume we, we go through all of these hurdles, right? Let we, let's assume we smash through them. Let's let's project into the future. Um, let's go forward a hundred years. What what is a society with a with a very? I mean, and if you're not comfortable with that distance of time, I assure you, you can take it back a little bit. Um, but what is a what does a society look like? that is, has been fundamentally radically transformed by blockchain technology? I think you see a lot more machine-to-machine -machine payments, payments that aren't necessarily um, executed by, by, a, by, a, by a human, I guess, um, at that particular time. Um, and I think we will also interact with more sort of autonomous type entities, like cars, I think that's probably the most predictable one. Can, can, um, you, can you unfurl that one a little bit? Because yeah. I know that's a common topic. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, it's no secret that there's a lot of people working on self-driving cars. Um, and I, you know, I imagine that at some point, Uber will have a fleet of, you know, they might not have any drivers in 20 years. They may just have, you know, uh, you know they may lease a million cars and have them all out there picking up people. And, you know, from a cost standpoint, it makes sense for them because their margins go up. Um, and you know, if you know, we're, we're just we're paying the vehicle at that point, or we're paying Uber directly. Uh, you know, we're not you know, nothing's going to the driver. Uh, so it, in that sense, you know, I guess it's not a machine machine payment, but there's 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 you know our relationship with the service provider is literally just uh, it's a it's a machine. Um, so I think you're going to see more of that too. Uh, you know, I think is I fully expect 3D printing to become much more of a of a thing. Um, you know, my uh, my wild analogy is, you know, when we ever put somebody on Mars, if they break something, we'll just print it out. We'll send them a blueprint, they'll print it out. Uh, we won't need to send, you know, another supply uh, mission up there for them, uh, hopefully. So, so, I think if that's the case, then, you know, I'm not, I'm not having to go to a store to buy something. I can just, you know, I'm buying a piece of software, I'm buying a design, I'm buying, a, you know, a, a uh, some sort of file offline, and I, you know, put it in my printer, and you know, have a coffee cup, whatever it is. Um, so, and I think our as you as more things in our, our house.
house start getting, or your apartment or whatever, start getting connected to the internet, they can start communicating more with one another and optimizing things. You know, I think it would become a lot cheaper. Um, you know, if I can, you know, we can send a penny here and a penny there, a fraction of a penny here and a fraction of a penny there. Um, then I think those machines can run more optimally and everything is more efficient. And as we take sort of the human resources out of it too, it takes the margins, you know, the margins are higher. Have you given any thought to this idea that Mike Hearn proposed of the self-owning car? Uh, where the, we're not, now, that, now that the cars can drive themselves, what if they're given a, a mandate uh, to be, if they, can, if they are able to carry money, why can't they own themselves and pay and go contract out to a repair facility when they detect that they're damaged? Uh, and then we don't have an Uber at all, but we have instead autonomous agents driving around, taking contracts to pick people up and drop them off. I, I think that's an interesting one. Yeah, so one of the things that we're, we're creating is um, I'm, I'm constantly thinking about how we're redefining trust and we're ultimately going to be able to trust each other a whole lot more. But we're also, like you just mentioned, we're opening up a, a way for everybody to understand somehow to trust a machine or trust a, a software program more than we do already because it's, there's the, there's, it's consensus-based. Everybody can really take a look at how it's functioning and, and everything that it's done in the past. And, um, they can understand what it's going to do in every single situation, and that eliminates the fear and the need to trust. So it's, I'm not sure what the society is going to look like 100 years from now, but it's definitely fun to imagine what, how I would be raised in a society that did not have as much fear and did not um, have to rely on trust as much and um, so much of the, the human elements that make things difficult. Is that good or bad? I'm not sure. I mean, yeah. some people would argue that the, that the fear and the trust issues are what drive innovation and creativity. That's yet to be seen. But. Uh, I think my co-panelists are thinking far too small. Um, in a hundred years, I intend to be a fully digitized consciousness uh, existing on a plethora of servers throughout the universe. Um, and I will be paying for my CPU and storage time via digital currency and transacting via smart contracts. So, okay, so, so what, what you're describing here is actually not an uncommon idea. Yeah. Uh, as we move forward, uh, we're starting to understand that more and more things are being able to be represented digitally. And this is, that, that is a very, very big goal. But the more we start thinking about this, the more we start building. These, these bodies that we have, they're very, very mortal, right? The technology gives the opportunity for things to last much longer, right? Uh, I, I think that that's a, that's a very compelling way, reason for us to pursue this type of technology because then, well, you have the self-driving cars, you know, well, what's the lifespan of a self-driving car? Or perhaps you add the code into the self-driving car that once it's built up enough profit that it goes and licenses another self-driving car. So now you have these autonomous organizations, if you will, going and fulfilling individual tasks uh, and forming new types of structures. And I think that's something you'll see and will build a bridge to this, what some people think is uh, lofty. Uh, I, I think it makes it very tangible and real. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and transition to questions. Does anybody have questions for our panelists today? No questions. All right, let's do it. So uh, I guess this goes to all the panels. So what um what two point oh projects are you really looking forward to? There's Ethereum, there's Factum, there's uh Base BitShares. Um I guess if you can name uh what you think is what you what you think is gonna do well and what you think is uh not so great. Well, I don't know if it's considered a 2.0 project, but I'm most excited about side chains. Um, and that's because I believe side chains will be an accelerator for evolution of Bitcoin technology. Um, I, be I believe you actually spoke to it earlier, but uh, you know, essentially that allows for people to experiment with the technology without taking all the financial risk. Um, as for if uh, Ethereum or or any of the other 2.0 projects will succeed or fail. I mean, I hope they all succeed. Uh, unfortunately, I 
you know, we're at the point now where the, the innovation is accelerating such in this space that I can't keep up with it all. And I'm, I'm still focused on Bitcoin 1.0. I, I think that we still have to solve security and usability problems in 1.0 um, before I feel comfortable devoting any of my time to 2.0. But I think it's great. I think it's great that people are devoting time. I stumped on our panel for like six months, exactly like that. But no, I think people need to be thinking further ahead and they need to be taking bigger risks um, because otherwise we're only going to take one step at a time. If we can take giant leaps at a time, I'm all for that. Yeah, we're definitely in a situation where we need more engineers to really explore all of the uh, facets of the technology as fast as people are coming up with ideas. Um, personally, I'm not sure if, or I'm most excited about um, the Ethereum concept. Um, I'm, I think that Ethereum is very similar to um, the current uh, arms race when it comes to mobile phones. So you've got your, your Android and your Apple and your Windows phone, and it all really boils down to, at the end of the day, what, the, what developers put stuff on the App Store, what the users can do with the technology. I think that Ethereum will be uh, very successful if the developers can figure out how to use it and how to build awesome things with it. Um, right now, I haven't seen hundreds of smart contract ideas, so that applies to the whole smart contract concept. Um, so at the end of the day, whatever 2.0 or 3.0 or whatever um, Ethereum-like product exists, whichever one is the easiest for developers to use and is adopted the fastest by those developers to fill up the ecosystem with useful products is going to be the most successful. So that's what I'm really excited to see. I know there's a certain, uh, couple of other uh, legal 2.0 projects that have sort of started to emerge. What are you most excited about? Um, I mean, you know, my, my fascination isn't even necessarily with, with some of the legal innovations. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to go back to the cybersecurity thing. I, I, I still think there's, there's a ton of opportunity for somebody to secure other, other data using, uh, using a blockchain. Um, and from a business opportunity standpoint, I think that's one of the biggest. I mean, there's, that is the focus of any, you know, major company right now is how to secure their, their, their customer data. Uh, and, or, or payment data or medical records, whatever it is. I mean, whoever, whoever figures that out uh, will make a lot more. Do we have one more question? All right, one more. So we had the, uh, this legal panel, uh, and they we're going over these cases where there was some sort of uh, criminal or whatnot. Uh, but we did talk about the faults of the government, for example, that you know, 23 years after the internet's been widely popular, the Office of Personnel Management led uh, hackers into its database, uh, revealing sensitive contact information about um, many workers, including top secret for the CIA and so forth. So it seems to me, I was curious, what do you, what, is government really uh, strong enough to withstand all this change in five, or do you think, in, say, 10 years from now, uh, will there be a United States of America government? I find that to be a fascinating thought experiment because I see you know, technology is not only advancing, but it's accelerating. And it's, it's difficult for the human mind to grasp the acceleration of a thing because we extrapolate based upon previous uh, deltas. So uh, whether or not the government can keep up, uh, I'm, I'm not optimistic, uh, but it's certainly possible. Um, so, you know, I'm a software engineer, so I, I see all these, you know, agile development technologies, and I see the government not using any sort of agile development methods. Um, I think it's certainly possible for the government to change, you know, how they enact policies and how they operate in general to be more responsive to changes um, on the technology side. Um, but as it is, you know, uh, we've, we've seen this several times, and I know the legal panel talked about it, is that it's a constant arms race of, of technology versus regulation, of criminals versus law enforcement. And I don't think that is ever going to end. Um, you know, whether or not the, the criminals are eventually going to be able to destroy the government or the government destroy the criminals, and I don't see that ever happening either. Um, but uh, if you want to talk about, like, uh, you know, 
techno, uh, crypto, anarchist utopias. I'm happy to talk about that too, but also those are all utopias and the real world is a much more complicated place. All right, let's give our panelists a round of applause.